such a problem with uh, the safety features um, when they're operating and more significantly dealing with the spent fuel rods once um, they're done. It seems like a good idea as long as it can be done cleanly and there's ways to dispose of the waste in a safe manner. Clear in general and what do we do with the waste and I think there's better ways to produce energy. Solar, uh, hydro, uh, wind. Honestly, my gut feeling is that I don't, I'm not in favor of it, but I, I don't know hardly anything about it. Okay, I'll second that. I'll second that. <laughs>
I give lectures uh, on this topic, I show the energy density of wood versus coal versus oil versus nuclear. And it's, you know, after all these years, it's still striking to me to look at those slides and realize the enormous advantage that, you know, that this little pellet that is three, three barrels of oil or one ton of coal or 17,000 cubic feet of The, the other uh, major advantage it has over fossil plants is the lack of uh, gaseous and liquid uh, discharge uh, uh, to the environment. Clearly, coal plants uh, have a real challenge in that they're releasing large amounts of greenhouse gases in addition to particulates. So the cleanliness in terms of um, impact on, on the environment, direct release to the environment, it's a huge advantage. It's absolutely a huge advantage. The one piece of the equation some people forget sometimes is the economic development side. When you drop a nuclear plant into a community, it is a heck of a boon for that community. You interview the people, for example, in Covert Township where the Palisades plant is, and they'll tell you that that project has been good to them uh, in terms of taxes, in terms of revenues for their school systems and things like that. And that's a part, a piece that a lot of people don't understand is that there is economic development and communities who may be hurting from a, the perspective of jobs and things like that look to these types of projects from that beneficial perspective. By the very nature, by the very physics, by the very math of it, we cannot explode into like a weapon would. One of the great problems with nuclear energy in general is that it was born as a weapon. The first time that most anyone heard of nuclear energy was Hiroshima. And uh, that has colored ever, everything ever since, particularly in the country that used the weapons. Not so much so in other countries, but particularly in this country. So there has been the connection between weapons and peaceful nuclear energy in many people's minds, meaning that if they opposed nuclear weapons, then automatically they were also opposed to nuclear power. The majority of people's introduction to nuclear anything in the 1950s was weapons. Okay. So uh, their immediate reaction was something very bad, something terrifying. Now, individual pockets around the country don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, there are a lot of people that live near plants that are perfectly comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people like myself that started their professional careers in the Navy and we essentially lived on nuclear reactors who are fairly comfortable. Right, so a little bit depends on what you're exposed to. It is not easy to get nuclear material to explode like bomb. It took the Manhattan Project to figure out how to do it. And a nuclear reactor can't do that. It can certainly have a runaway reactor operation I can't deny that because I watched it for eight days from a satellite for the Chernobyl reactor. It took us eight, took the Russians eight days to get that reactor shut down. But at no time was it running any risk of blowing up like a nuclear explosion. Yes, you can have extreme releases of energy. You have a lot of stored energy, thermal energy, chemical energy, and nuclear energy. But the nuclear energy cannot release itself in the way under the weapon. It, it can disperse radioactivity over a local region. But it is not going to kill tens of thousands of people. In the 70s, when we were building the first generation of commercial plants with the Three Mile, Three Mile Island accident, 
In Three Mile Island, a series of events led to a partial melting of the, the core of the reactor. And at that time, one of the one of the issues and big questions was, if the core starts to melt, um, will we ever be able to stop this molten mass from going through the concrete pad underneath the reactor and, and contaminating the uh, uh, ground and the like? And the systems and the reactor uh, behaved as it was designed. It, there was core melting, uh, the core melting was contained. Again, there were no uh, re radiation releases that put the, the public in any harm or danger. I mean, yes, we lost a multi-billion dollar reactor uh, and the money that, that was invested into it. But the point of the matter is that was a very serious accident. And yet nobody uh, in the public was um, injured from that. And you know, it sort of demonstrated this philosophy that the industry has always followed, which is called defense in depth. Multiple, multiple barriers um, to the release of radiation to the general public. What fear do we have? There was, there's some concerns we might have, like if there is an accident and if there is enough hydrogen created because of some reaction that happens with a cladding material zirconium with water, there might be some hydrogen. That could uh, lead to some concern, but then there are so many safety features in a reactor, like hydrogen igniters and things to take care of that, that even that is not a concern. And that, and this safety features, these safety features were in reinforced more so than they were before after the TMI accident when this was, this was becoming an issue that people were getting concerned about. Chernobyl accident is an outlier. The Chernobyl accident to me would be defining like someone trying to lift off a plane with having the wings cut off. That's what was Chernobyl. Chernobyl is something that never could occur in this country because uh, we don't, we don't uh, build reactors like was done in Russia. It's a very different type of reactor. Uh, the bottom line there, the real simple answer is didn't have a containment. So it's not even licensable in this country. Our rules and regulations for licensing nuclear plants would never have allowed that to be licensed by the NRC, let alone built. So it's actually pretty irrelevant um, from our, our standpoint. The safety record in this country is ridiculous. It's so amazing. You can't find another industry, uh, you know, that can say that they've been operating as long as we have, for instance, and have never had a fatality. I mean, that's just insane. Think of uh, oil refineries and coal mine, uh, coal mining. I mean, you know, they're they're so desensitized to death in those industries that, you know, another oil refinery fire could happen six months from now, and it would make a newspaper maybe in you know page 17 in, in a bottom corner. From coal all the time and if if you were to take a hard look at those fatalities those dwarf any predicted fatalities that would come from nuclear energy. You had the problem with black lung disease, the pollution of the atmosphere. Look at how many coal accidents we have and how many miners get trapped. But they no one ever calls for the a complete abolition of um, of coal mining or or use of coal, you know that's what's happened in our industry, and we've never had a fatality. I mean, people want to shut this thing down with absolutely no good reason. We do have solid wastes that we have to deal with. These are the very highly radioactive fuel that, once it's run its course through a reactor, has, something has to be done with it. A variety of ways to go. Most nations around the world have decided on deep geologic disposal. That seems to be through, again, studies conducted in many countries, um, uh, basically agreed upon a uh, best way to, to store the wastes and isolate them. Now when I say store, what does that mean? The objective is to put the wastes into a location uh, such that they are isolated from the population for a time until they decay back to the level uh, of the uranium that was originally mined. Uh, and if you can do that, then after some period of time, the toxicity is it's benign, it's neutral, it's the same as, as, as what it came from. Uh, there are a variety of ways to, to deal with the fuel. In this country, we've decided to do a permanent burial, and we are doing what's called a once-through cycle. So we take the fuel rods, which come in assemblies out of a reactor, 
And the idea is they'll be packed inside of casks, and those casks will be encased in a couple of layers, shielded, um, and, and placed in a permanent geologic repository, which here in the U.S., Yucca Mountain has been selected as that rep repository, and they will be permanently set there until they decay. Um, that's going to take a long time. It's going to take a really long time. That could take hundreds of thousands of years. First thing we need to do is reprocessing. All right. Um, number one, it will reduce the cost of nuclear fuel. Number two, it removes a lot of long-lived isotopes and things that we have have to take care of. And and number three, um, it just doesn't make sense to to take you know 50, 60 percent of the fuel that's usable and store it in some sort of system. And so I think reprocessing is an absolute key. You look at the rest, I mean, France does it all the time. Uh, we've had cases where our reactors are buying French fuel because it's cheaper, because they're doing reprocessing. Um, they've proven you can do it safely. And, and the concept of, of nuclear proliferation is, is, to me, just a hogwash in terms of, especially if you can do it in federally controlled facilities and stuff like that. The next problem that came along was really just the engineering problem of being able to build these plants on budget and in time. And it turned out we were just totally incapable of doing that in the social structure that we found ourselves with interveners and the public able to. When I was in the industry back in the, in the 80s and um, intervention in the regulatory process, um, was extreme, uh, forcing companies to spend a lot of money trying to get these projects licensed and that. Uh, regulation was changing at a very rapid rate, um, especially in, in after Three Mile Island, to the point where those of us trying to build nuclear plants were forced to really be modifying the projects after they were three quarters of the way constructed, which was just driving costs to the roof. But to a large extent, that was the industry's fault itself for lack of standardization. Every plant was unique, and so every plant was its own separate battle. The French have gone with standard designs, and they haven't had that problem. Uh, you know, we see that today they can be operated. Sort of the theory is proven uh, with today's plants, and that they can be operated extremely cheaply. Again, they're, they're operated significantly less than coal and gas is why. But the capital costs are very, very high. They're still high. And uh, I think the incentive for taking those capital costs uh, will come in the form of uh, penalty on carbon generation, on greenhouse gas generation. And uh, so that's yet to be seen. What if there is nuclear? What if there's alternative energy? And what if there is not? You can't get into this and say that nuclear energy has no problems. Uh, but you can't really say that about energy in any energy source. And getting to the point where people will honestly say, if we go nuclear, you know, there are certain benefits are certain um, problems we have to deal with, but that's true of every single energy source. We have got to look for putting together a set of solutions, not one single one, and that means nuclear. It's going to mean some coal, you know, because in certain areas coal is going to, you know, is going to be a preferred choice, right? I mean, I think people in general, and it's a good inclination, want to optimize the amount of traditional renewable sources, whether it's wind, solar, maybe not hydro so much because it's got some environmental consequences that people are already having problems with. Uh, and we will push to do that because people people want that. I mean, across the board, I think people want that. Uh, but I think if you look and project forward, um, you're going to have to increase base load at some point, right? And when that puts you into coal or nuclear power, and so I think in the end, we'll end up with some, some mix of all of these sources. But it's hard for me to imagine the nuclear won't be a part of the discussion, especially for large base load. Right now, the number one concern in the world is energy. And the resource that can meet it in, 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 in a proper shape is, is nuclear, because everything else has, is, not, is not mature. The technology is not mature enough. You cannot provide the hundreds of gigawatts of energy or more that is needed to sustain the world the way it's going on, the way it's developing, with a, with a soaring needs. Today. You can't build a gigawatt solar plant. You can't build a gigawatt wind uh, farm. Uh, it's, it's, it's too expensive. It's too costly.
costly. Uh, nuclear energy is not a very cheap solution, uh, alternative, but it is a proven technology. At other alternatives, such as central station, solar, or wind, it comes back to the energy density issue. Solar is great. The amount of energy coming from the sun that lands on the earth um, you know, is in, in, in a matter of a few hours is equivalent to our entire yearly consumption for the entire earth. So it's fabulous. The problem is density. The energy density is so low um, that even at high efficiencies of conversion, say by photovoltaic, the land area required to generate the same amount of, of uh, power as a nuclear plant is going to be tens to hundreds to thousands of times. It'll be phenomenal. And I think if we try and build an energy infrastructure of central station electricity generating plants out of solar energy, the public's going to quite quick figure out very quickly that means turning over massive amounts of land uh, and devoting it to that purpose. That isn't going to go over well. And all of a sudden, a, a nuclear plant on one one thousandth or one ten thousandth of land area isn't going to look so bad. And the same is true with, with wind. Again, these are important sources, and we have to learn to tap them. But I think they're going to be very regional. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we've got other issues with renewables. Renewables are great, but we have to figure out the storage issue. There are going to be certain places where it absolutely makes sense to put wind in, yeah. right? I mean, you've got good wind, it's good solid, you've got a way to store the energy, for instance. Um, but you have to recognize that, um, you know, that may mean a lot of extra transmission lines. It may mean uh, a choice between wind and agriculture, you know, because you're using the land for something else. And you just got to ask all those questions honestly. So You've, you've got to find solutions that, that make sense across the board. Um, and, and, and the issues of renewables, um, finding sources that, that we, can, we can tap today is what we've got to do, and nuclear is one of those. It's time. I mean, it, it, we're at an interesting um, confluence of, of global warming, uh, you know, uh, energy as, a, as an important aspect of um, homeland security, um, and um, in, just in terms of uh, you know, being able to, to deal with the, the number, vast number of people in the world and, and global population. We've got to look at nuclear as part of the solution set. And that solution set includes energy efficiency, it includes load and demand side controls, it looks at the whole footprint and how we are using energy within this country. The U.S. is an amazing talent in terms of technology, technological innovation. We have, we can do this. Coal is not a fossil fuel. Coal is a fossil. It's only a fossil fuel if you're not smart enough to think of anything else to do with it, but burn it like cave people used to do, okay? I mean, the discovery of fire is prehistory, okay? And if the only thing we can do with our carbon resource is combust it, that's not very advanced engineering. Chemical engineers actually take carbon and convert it to useful things that we use in everyday life, like plastics and medicines that. And certainly chemical use of carbon is much more sophisticated and much more advanced than caveman combustion, cavewoman combustion.